Thank you. It's good to be in New York. Good to be in New York. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good. So I guess we can start this lecture. This lecture is titled, The Freedom Society. It is a vision for building God's ideal world. Then you know that God created human beings as his children, and he desired to inherit to them the three blessings. First, to be fruitful or achieve individual perfection, to multiply, to form a family, and third, to have dominion over creation. As a condition for giving his children these blessings, he had to also give them both freedom and responsibility. And we know that in the Garden of Eden, there was God, Adam and Eve, and the archangels. And God gave his commandments to Adam and Eve. He told them how they should live their lives, what they should do, what was the right way, what they needed to accomplish in order to inherit God's blessings and create the kingdom of heaven on earth. But then we know what happened in this story. The archangel transformed himself into Satan. He left his position, the position of the archangel, which was to serve and be the servant of Adam and Eve. He left that position to transform himself into the master of Adam and Eve. He did this by first seducing Eve. And then through the seduction of Eve, Eve, together with the archangel, seduced Adam. As a result, Adam and Eve fell. They were chased from the Garden of Eden, and they were separated from God. The children of God, Adam and Eve, went from being the children of God to being the slaves of the archangel, Lucifer. And as a result, they lost not only the three blessings, but they also lost freedom and responsibility. As a result of the fall, Human beings have lived under dictators and tyrants throughout the vast span of human history. Human history has been one of suffering. Humanity have, has basically been enslaved, has been tortured, and has been killed arbitrarily. Nonetheless, God worked throughout the providence to try to restore mankind back to the original Garden of Eden. Although Humankind lived in misery throughout most of history. The memory of freedom nonetheless remained. The freedom that humanity once had in the Garden of Eden. And throughout the vast span of human history, we see brief glimpses of freedom rising up like a dream. We saw that in ancient Greece and in the Republic of Rome. But freedom is not sustained. It invariably dies. Aristotle wrote, republics decline into democracies, and democracies degenerate into despotism. We know the story of Athenian democracy. When democracy came to Athens, there was great creativity and hope, energy and entrepreneurship. Athens grew to be a powerful city-state. It came to control the trade in the Aegean, and it grew wealthy and strong. But as the city-state of Athens grew in power, a subtle change came over the people of Athens. They realized that in democracy, you could vote for even unwise policies. And that is what happened in Athens. The people of Athens voted for things that were popular but unwise. They started a war with Sparta. That war lasted 30 years and resulted in their defeat. They continued to pursue unwise policies, sending colonists out to Italy, trying to engage in other very unprofitable and populist ventures. The result is that their treasuries emptied, 
and they became weak. And ultimately, Athens was unable to defend itself against King Philip II of Macedon, and Athens was defeated. Freedom died in Athens, and the free people of Athens became slaves or serfs to their new king, King Philip II of Macedon. Freedom died. We saw a similar story in the Republic of Rome. When Rome was founded, the people elected their representatives to the Senate to represent them. Rome had two councils and had a system of checks and balances and a balance of power. For a first couple of hundred years, Rome was ruled with wisdom and grew and prospered and started to create the empire of Rome. But towards the end of the Roman Republic, you saw popularism rise in this great and powerful city-state. The people of Rome started to demand free stuff for themselves. They saw that the empire was prosperous. And they said, well, we should have some too. They demanded land distribution to the poor. Corn, well, that's too expensive. We should have subsidized corn. They demanded that corn be free. They should get free food, debts, well. You know, we don't want to repay that. Why should we repay our debts? Cancel them. Power-hungry leaders used welfare policies to gain popular support against the Senate. And ultimately, these policies, these demands, led to the collapse of the Roman Republic. The Republic of Rome died, and imperial Rome was born. The free people of Rome lost their freedom and became serfs and slaves to their new imperial master. Once again, freedom died. You see popularism in the modern age. Perón promising to redistribute wealth to the poor people of Argentina came to power at the time when he came to power, Argentina was one of the 10th wealthiest nations on earth. By the time his disastrous reign ended, Argentina had descended to be one of the poorer countries of the world. You saw the same expansion of the state under Hitler and the rise of Nazi Germany. You know, Hitler was democratically elected. The Weimar Republic produced Hitler and the Nazi party. And as he expanded the state and started building the mechanisms of war, he got people to work. And they loved him. He promised the Germans that he would make them the master race and that all races would be slaves to the German state. And he led his people to disastrous war and the destruction of the European continent, and ultimately to the destruction of Germany. Popularism again led to dictatorship and destruction. We see the same thing in Venezuela. Hugo Chavez rose to power, promising that he would feed the poor, that he would distribute wealth. And when he got in power, he made himself dictator. You can see the results of popularism in modern Greece today. The uncontrolled expansion of the state, the uncontrolled expansion of social welfare policies have led to the collapse of modern Greece. And today, Greece is ruled by the dictatorship of Europe. Throughout Europe, out-of-control social welfare spending in southern Europe is threatening to bankrupt the entire continent. Spain is following in the path of Greece, Italy, Portugal. Now France elected a socialist president. Their financial situation continues to deteriorate. Even Germany's credit rating has now been given a negative outlook.
As we look at history, we see an irrefutable pattern. What starts as democracy and hope leads to popularism. And popularism leads to dictatorship and the death of freedom. It turns out that all that free stuff from government is not free. The price is your freedom. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the father of the modern welfare state, actually in his 1935 State of the Union address said, to dole our relief in this way is to administer a narcotic, a subtle destroyer of the human spirit. That is what FDR understood welfare to be, a drug. And that is exactly what it is. It is an addiction. It is a narcotic. And our country is addicted to it. As we study the principle, we know that God prepares the age for the coming of the Messiah. He did this before Jesus came. He raised up the Republic of Rome created an environment where Jesus could then come to spread the gospel. And God has prepared this age today to receive the Lord of the Second Advent. As you know, freedom has not existed throughout the majority of human history. But today, freedom and democracy has actually spread wider and broader than has ever existed in the history of man. This is not an accident. This is not because we are secularly enlightened. It is because God is bringing mankind back up to a comparable level before the fall. As we know, Adam and Eve fell at the top of the growth stage. So when God prepares the age of the Messiah, he brings the nations and the people of the world up to a level similar to where Adam and Eve were prior to their fall. And this is why we see freedom and democracy spread wider than we have ever had seen in human history. But this freedom is not certain. It is fragile. There is no guarantee that we will keep this freedom. It is for us to decide whether we, as the people of the world, will together collectively decide to unite with the Lord of the Second Advent and fulfill God's purpose of creation, or if we, the people of the world, will fail to unite with the Lord of the Second Advent and receive God's judgment. As Adam and Eve faced their choice as they reached their level of maturity and development in the Garden of Eden. We too face that choice today. And the choice that we make will have significant and resounding consequences to all of your lives and to everybody you know. But then, at this time, what is it that we must do? How should we unite with the Lord of the Second Advent? What is God's will for the earth? How do we know if we are fulfilling God's will? These questions arise. But think about it, brothers and sisters. Where did we all start? Creation started in the Garden of Eden. This was the place of freedom of responsibility where Adam and Eve were to grow to inherit God's blessings. In our conception, this was the place where the kingdom of heaven was to be born, the ideal world. But because of the fall of man, what happened, brothers and sisters? We lost that Garden of Eden. We were chased out of it. And the providence of history, the history of restoration, the hope of all humankind, has always been to return to that Garden of Eden. 
Don't you agree? But you know, there were only four actors in the Garden of Eden. There was God, Adam and Eve, and the archangels. How can we possibly understand today's world filled with seven billion people in the context of the Garden of Eden? This is the question that we face. But if we truly contemplate this question with a serious and prayerful mind and seek the truth in the words given to us in the principle and by our true parents, there is an answer. And this answer will help us understand God's will for the world today. We know from our true parents' words, from their instruction that they have taught us, that true parents have fulfilled God's conditions and formed their four position foundation. As a result, they have created the conditions to fulfill their role as the returning Lord of the Second Advent. And in doing so, they have actually become the substantial representatives of God here on earth. This is what they have taught us. As a result, we can ascertain very clearly that on earth, true parents stand in the position of God. If true parents are in the position of God, then who are Adam and Eve? Who was Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? They were children of God, right? So then who are Adam and Eve today? Hmm? Yeah. God's children would be Adam and Eve, right? So when we look at America, all the men would represent Adam. Then who are, who's Eve? All the women, Adam and Eve, the citizens, the people, are in the position of Adam and Eve. But then, who is the archangel? Maybe this is the more significant question. We know who God is. We know that the people that represent Adam and Eve. But then who is the archangel? Right? Well, we know that in the story of the Garden of Eden, that the position of the archangel was to be the servant of Adam and Eve. In a democracy, who do we call the servant of the people? You guys are smart. It is clear from that analysis that the government would be in the position of the archangel. So now we have the representation of the Garden of Eden. God, Adam and Eve, and the archangels. But then the question arises, what is popularism? Think about it, brothers and sisters. What happened in the fall? What was the fall? Was it just a temptation of Adam and Eve? Of course that occurred. But if you look at the whole fall, it was the process by which the archangel went from being the servant of Adam and Eve to becoming the master of Adam and Eve. That was the fall. Think about what happens in popularism. The government, as a servant of the people, goes to the vulnerable people. It approaches first the ladies. It says, I will give you aid to families with dependent children. I'll give you health care, food stamps, welfare. Social Security, I'll take care of you. 
Just trust me. You don't need that man of yours. Just marry me. Well, and children have many. The more children you have with whatever man you want to be with at any time, I'll give you more money. You don't need Adam. You just need me. You only need the government. Isn't that what the government tells the ladies today? Isn't that what's happening in our society? We see this right in front of our eyes. Then what happens? After the government passes its social welfare legislation, what do they build next? They build the bureaucracies to run and administer that program. And who gets hired for that program? Men. The government passes out government jobs and government pensions. So look what happens. First, the archangel induces Eve to fall. Then the archangel and Eve induce Adam to fall. The government first seduces the women of society. And together with the women, they seduce the men. And then the government goes from being the servant of the people, transforms itself into the master of the people. What is that? That is the fall of man. The process by which the government goes from being the servant of the people to being the master of the people is the fall of man at the national level. We are seeing our country and the democracies of the world fall. This is the path to God's judgment. This is the path to being ejected from the Garden of Eden. This is the principle. We are seeing the fall of man, the fall of our country the fall of democracy. We are seeing freedom and responsibility die. Then what is the kingdom of heaven on earth? Where should we go? If we are on the road to hell and damnation, where should we be going? What does Father say is the kingdom of heaven on earth? How does he describe it? We know that when Father has been talking about the kingdom of heaven since 2005, he has repeatedly over and over again mentioned three concepts. The first concept is peace military and peace police force. And then he talks about this society of conscience, a society without laws, no lawyers, prosecutors, or judges. And these are the concepts which our true parents have used over and over and over again in the, during the last seven years to describe the kingdom of heaven. But when we hear these concepts, when I heard these concepts, kind of scratched my head and said, what does that mean? I don't quite get it. And I know a lot of you, too, have been scratching your heads. Am I right? Yes. 
And so for a long time, well, we all struggled, and of course I struggled to try to understand this. But as we began to seriously search for truth and understanding in true parents' words, only from the point of view of searching for truth, then somehow God showed us the way. Let us understand the meaning, the deep meaning, which existed in those precious words. And actually, when we really think about it, maybe we can't create a society which actually has no laws, but we can get awfully close. And that society is called a self-regulating society. And you don't need many ingredients to create a self-regulating society. You need law and order. And you need the ability to register private property of all different kinds. If you have private property, free markets, and competition, you have a self-regulating society. A society which creates its own rules without government. And this society works. Everything that works in our current society comes from self-regulation. You guys all like iPhones, right? Who's got an iPhone? Good product, right? Who created the iPhone? Steve Jobs, right? You mean Obama didn't order Steve Jobs to make the iPhone? I thought government did that. You're telling me that it didn't? But this is the point. If you look at markets, and look at this market for telephones, all the companies in the marketplace compete to make a better quality product at a better price so that they can gain a customer. And it's the company which provides the best value to the customer which gets that customer's money. And so it is the free market and the competition in that market which motivates companies to regulate themselves to be able to deliver that product. And that is where self-regulation comes from. It comes from freedom and competition. And wherever you have private property, freedom and competition, you will get self-regulation. Self-regulation is not only effective in the electronics market, but it can be applied to every single market that exists. There is no reason why government needs to do education. Education can be provided 100% by private self-regulating markets. Since the founding of the Department of Education in the 1970s, real spending per pupil, per student, has increased by 100%. During that same period, our international standing in math and science has plummeted to the point where now we are 27 out of the 30 industrialized nations. The only thing we have gotten from the government monopolization of education we have gotten an inferior product at a higher price. Did you know that for the first 200 years of our nation's history, the federal government's share of national GDP was less than 5%? But yet, schools were built. Hospitals were built, roads were built, railroads were built, 
People got educated. They got healed. Welfare was done. But it wasn't done by government. It was done by private citizens. Freedom works. It always has. What doesn't work is government. Think about it, brothers and sisters. When you go shopping for a flat screen TV, where do you go to look at the product? You go to Best Buy, right? You go to Best Buy and you check out that flat screen TV, nice 42 inches. It's color, it's features. But do you buy that Best Buy? You go home and you order it from where? Amazon. Why do you do that? Because you cut out the middleman, right? And cutting out the middleman makes it cheaper. Then why do we have a middleman between our caring for each other? Isn't that what we're doing when we give our taxes to the government? They take a cut and they supposedly give it back to the needy? Isn't that a middleman? Isn't it? Well, you know how to shop for a TV, but what is this? Instead of getting rid of the middleman, you put them there. How does that make sense? That's the fundamental problem with the way we are structuring our compassion. We're not caring for our brother. We're just saying we don't have to care because we got government to do it. And so our families break down. Our communities break down. And we feel alienated and isolated from each other. We don't care for each other the way we used to. Even before we had government welfare, we had caring for each other. It was called philanthropy. And philanthropy existed everywhere in America, in every community. Before government took over welfare, the churches provided welfare. But when they helped out their fellow brother, they looked him in the eye and they said, hey brother, we'll give you a hand, but you're going to have to kick those drugs. You're going to have to make good with your wife. You're going to have to be good to your brother. We cared for each other. We were each other's keepers. But now, what do we do? Are we our brother's keepers anymore? We have lost compassion. We have lost caring. And we have replaced it with bureaucracy. And this is an aberration. It is a corruption of all that is good in good people's hearts and minds. It is a corruption of what God originally intended for his children to live. Brothers and sisters, we don't need government to regulate us. God did not create Adam and Eve so that he could be regulated and ruled by his servant. He created us for freedom and responsibility. Then what is this peace police and peace military? And why does Father talk about this so much? Well, the closest we can understand or come to grasp the peace military, 
would be a, like a militia, Swiss, a militia system like we see today in Switzerland. Basically, every citizen is a part-time soldier. Every citizen has a machine gun in his house. And the Swiss actually distribute the other weapons as well, the tanks and the planes, and they each have, are distributed to the citizens, and each team runs their tank or their plane. And so every Swiss citizen has a full-time job, but in their part-time, they're a soldier. And you know, that is the way America used to be. That is the way we used to be. The police, peace police, would be just basically the militia system applied to the police. That would mean all the citizens would have their full-time job, but part-time they would be deputized. And the citizens would be the policemen, and they would police their neighborhoods. You would get an assignment. We, that's exactly the way America was. That's why the government ran so cheaply. Well, we had a problem with slavery in the U.S., and that was obviously against God's will. We are reasonable intellectual people. We can separate the good from the bad. Now, you can see in today's societies, Actually, there are still examples of freedom societies. We see them in Asia, Singapore, and Hong Kong. They are the freest economies on earth. And freedom works. They have the highest GNP per capita in the world. And they are the economies which have been most resistant to this severe financial crisis. Now, is this peace police and peace military just a practical solution to providing security and tranquility for our neighborhoods? Or is there deeper significance? I mean, if true parents are really emphasizing this continuously, it must have more value than just a practical application of security, because there are many ways to have security. But think about what happened in the Garden of Eden, what God's desire was. When he created Adam and Eve, he desired to inherit to them what? The three blessings, right? Right? What was the first blessing? To mature, to be fruitful, to mature in your character, so that you become a very productive citizen in your society. Somebody who can contribute, hold down a job, be a good fellow, take care of himself, provide value to the entire community. Based on that individual maturing, then he inherits or moves on to the second blessing, which is what? To form a family and to have children. But then, what is the third blessing? We see that from the first blessing to the second blessing, we see a progression of greater responsibility, right? From the individual to the family. So somehow, when we think about the third blessing, we have an understanding that it entails more responsibility and greater maturity, correct? But look at the word which is described to you to describe the third blessing. What is that word? Dominion over creation. Dominion is a very powerful word. Let me ask you a question. Everybody here knows where steaks and hamburgers come from? How about chickens? You know where chicken comes from? Where the chicken leg from KFC comes from? Where does that come from? From a chicken, right? Okay. 
Now I got another question. Okay. How do we get the meat off the cow and the chicken? Do the chicken and the cow somehow just shed the meat and that's how we get it? Do you know how the meat comes off the chicken and the cow? We kill it, right? Isn't that right? We kill the chicken and the cow and that's how we get meat from them, right? So what does it mean for us to have dominion then over animals? It means we have the power to kill them. Doesn't it? I mean, who's owned a pet? Have you owned a pet? Who's owned a dog? Well, if you own a dog, you know that your dog has feelings, right? And the dreams, right? Now, an emotional dreaming creature, who gives you the right to kill it if it's argued from a humanistic or philosophical point of view. What gives you the right to kill the animals? What makes it right to kill the animals? If you don't take the position that God gave us that right. In the world of moral relativism, Instead of killing the animals to eat, maybe you should kill humans to eat. That's the strange conclusion that comes out of moral relativism. To say that humans, man and animals are equivalent. And the problem with moral relativism is that if you assume there's no God, and that God didn't give special privileges and rights to man, then that argument is sustainable. So we might as well kill each other and eat each other. And if you look at communism and socialism, that's what they do. Communism starves their own people. They kill them by the millions. And so does expansive socialistic states, which control everything. Look at Syria and Egypt. Libya, what they did to their people. Those are actually examples of expansive socialistic states because government basically owns almost everything. Without an understanding of God, without the knowing that God gave us the right to have dominion over animals, there is no justification for us killing and eating them. That is why, as we live our daily lives and eat our daily bread and our hamburgers, <laughs> we must be forever grateful to our Creator. Okay now, how many of you are hunters? Now, I got a question for you gentlemen. What makes man the master of animals? If you walk into the savannas of Africa, why are you the king of the beasts? What makes you master over the lion? What makes you master over the leper? What makes you master over the tiger or the bear? Now you're getting it. It's that word dominion. What gives us dominion over animals? It's called guns.
you know, there was a fellow in Alaska who believed that bears were his friends, and he was called the Grizzly Man. <laughs> and for a while, he was, you know, buddy buddy with the bears and hanging out with them. But then one day, the bears decided to eat him. <laughs> and they ate him. But he also brought his girlfriend along. So they ate her too. That is one thing you learn if you've ever hunted dangerous game. If you walk into the wilds with dangerous game, without a gun, you are part of the food chain. <laughs> it is the bearing of arms, of weapons, which makes man dominion, dominant over the animals. It is this power over life and death which makes us the masters of creation. As we study the principle, what do we learn? We learn that in the Garden of Eden, that God desired to inherit his three blessings to his children. And that he desired to inherit these blessings with freedom and responsibility, so that they could what? Do what? Complete his creation with him. What does that mean? That means God intended and desired for man to become and to be co-creators of creation. What does it mean to be a co-creator with God? That means you share His authority. And what authority does God have? the authority of life and death. So as we come to understand the third blessing and the fulfilling of man's responsibility to inherit God's creation, we can understand that man must mature to a level where he can under inherit the authority of God to become peace soldiers and peace policemen, to bear arms, for the benefit and the welfare of the nation and the community. It is our responsibility as children who would inherit God's creation to be able to develop in our maturity to the extent and level that we can possess and bear the power of life and death responsibly for the benefit of the whole community. Okay then, I think you got that. So the role of government is very simple. It needs to be reduced to the very smallest possible function. Government should just do defense, law and order, and the operation of the courts, nothing else. Here we can see God's vision of the ideal world and Satan's vision of the ideal world. In the Garden of Eden, think about what happened and what was God's desire. There was God, Adam and Eve, and the archangels, correct? And God wanted to inherit the creation, or the ownership of creation, to who? Adam and Eve. But there was still a servant in the house. It was the archangel. So the owners or the master's share of creation would go to who? Adam and Eve, right? And the servant's share would go to who? government, or the archangel. And this is what we are describing as the Freedom Society. It is a society where God's children, the citizens of the nation, own the children's share of the inheritance. Where the citizens own 90 to 95 percent of all property in that society. 
the servant share or government share is only 5 to 10 percent. This is what God originally willed. But think about it. When Adam and Eve fell, what happened? Adam and Eve were to inherit all or most of the creation, the children's share. But because of the fall, the archangel transformed himself into the master of Adam and Eve and basically took all of God's property. He made himself the owner of everything. And as you can see, that is communism. That is why we as a Unification Church community have fought against communism. Because it is Satan's ideal of the ideal world. It is his vision for how he wants to live. It is a society where the government owns everything and all of you are slaves to the government. then what is socialism? Socialism is a society where the government owns 70% of everything. It's 70% satanic. <laughs> then what is social welfare democracy? It's a society where the government owns 50%. It's 50% satanic. <laughs> and there you can see God's vision of the ideal world, Satan's vision of the ideal world. It's an all an issue of ownership. Whether Adam and Eve own the property or the archangel owns the property. This is principle. Simple, right? It's not that complicated. It's always been a struggle for ownership. God desires to inherit all things to his children. So it is written. As we study the principle, as we study the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the principle teaches us that Christ came not as the Messiah who would die on the cross, but that God's original intent was that Christ be the Lord of glory. And if the people of that time could accept Christ as the Messiah, then we believe and we understand that he would have formed God's family at that time and ushered the way for the creation of the kingdom of heaven. But because the people rejected Christ, Christ had to go the road of sorrows, the road of crucifixion. And his body was killed and taken by Satan. And as a result, Christianity could not deliver us from the hell of this earth. People continue to live in misery, under tyranny. But it offered spiritual salvation for those who could accept Christ as the Messiah. And though our bodies were tortured, our spirits could go to God. And this was the great blessing and the success of our Lord Jesus Christ. But the crucifixion of Christ had some very serious consequences for the world. As Christ's body was killed by Satan, actually in this world, spiritually, the organizations of the churches are actually dominated by the archangel. And as a result, if we look at history, churches and church organizations have supported large government and dictatorial organizations. Catholicism was actually established to support the emperor of Rome, Constantine. And as we know, in Russia, under the Tsars, the Russian Orthodox Church supported the Tsars. And we see this throughout human history. 
The architecture of tyranny was buttressed by churches. And even when freedom came to America for a brief time, it was actually the desire for compassion fueled by churches which actually pushed this great nation to build this welfare state which now threatens to consume our society and transform us into something which we fundamentally do not want. And that is why if man is to return to freedom, if we are to return to freedom, if we are to create the world, a freedom society that can last a thousand years, ten thousand years, then we need a new church, a new religion, a religion which can buttress the state of freedom of man. And this, my brothers and sisters, is the mission of the religion of the Lord of the Second Advent. Think about it, brothers and sisters. It is this teaching that we are discussing today. The teaching of the divine principle. The teaching of our true parents. The revelation of the story of the Garden of Eden. The understanding of God's will for human society. This will give us the power to sustain and preserve freedom on this earth. And when we teach our children and our children's children and children's children for generations to come this fundamental truth, this teaching from the Lord of the Second Half, that understanding and that truth will lead us the way to fulfill God's will and create the kingdom of heaven on earth. We, the members of the Unification Church, we stand for freedom. freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.